75th day of class and I hope you learn about Oceana. And Oceana is a part of the world that often gets neglected in the story of world history. And I have some theories why. But before we get into those, I want to take a step back to our past. In learning about the early human story, I said the world was divided into four world zones. And it was almost like having four separate worlds. They didn't intermingle. Uh, the first being the Americas the biggest, the one with the most advantages, the one that we learn the most history about, Afro, Eurasia, Africa, Europe, Asia. Then we have Australasia and pink here. And then we have the Pacific. And even in this picture of the four world zones, it almost looks like the border of the other three. It's very diminished. It's not emphasized. It seems to be almost dismissed when you talk about the other three. And <clears throat> this does affect the world of today, which we'll get into. So here's the question. When I say Oceana, what comes to mind? And I've come to grips with this. I am no longer going to fight this. The Disney Corporation is the first, has had the first inroads into your brains regarding history. When I say ancient China, my students think of Mulan. When I think, when I say Africa, they say the Lion King, sadly. The worst for Native Americans, Pocahontas, but Mo Moana might be the most historically um, digestible of all the Disney flicks. So a lot of people think of this. A lot of people think of tropical fruits. You know, you go to Myers and try something different, some, you know, kiwi and mango and papaya and coconut and pineapple. Uh, they might think of grass skirts and hula dancing and ukulele or surfing. These are the things that come to most people's minds. Now, uh, here's what I think of when I think of uh, the oceanic people. Of course, I have a little bit of a bias. We await the New Zealand haka. And Tonga's sipita. Their own unique challenge. to lead the Sipita. to New Zealand rugby viewers, Taniela Moore, Soma Tamalolo, adding a little bit extra in, here is the All Blacks Harker, led by Richie McCall. And Pity Wepu. Now, that doesn't motivate you. I don't know what will. Now, before you think I'm a total lunatic, uh, here's some evidence I'm not crazy. Uh, the most recent Olympics, the Fijians, a group of people from Oceana, won the Olympics in rugby. And here's a picture of me playing, and several of my teammates um, were from Oceanic nations. So that um, exchange between those two teams, the Tongans and the New Zealand team, primarily the Maoris, the native people of New Zealand, was showing the culture of oceanic people. And rugby is a part of it, and keeping those traditions is part of it. I just think it's cool. That motivates me. I should do that every morning before school. That'll get, get the blood going and whatnot. Now, here's the map that you've seen for a while, taking it away from rugby for a minute into standard geography. This has been on your wall of every classroom since you were in kindergarten. But I want to kind of flip the script a little bit and have you look at it from a different perspective. 
Now, if I simply present the world to you upside down, that's all it is. It's upside down. What happens to Oceana? Now, Oceana here, it almost creates borders of the quote unquote important parts the Americas, the uh, Africa, Europe, Asia, you know, Afro Eurasia, and Australia. But if you look at the upside down, you can see that Oceania is a huge geographic part of the world. It's not this distant border. It has meaning. There's something there. Here's a different perspective. This comes from MacArthur's Universal Corrective Map. And this map, presented this way, shows that Oceania is the most prominent geographical part in our world. You know how much of our world is made up of water, and these oceanic people live in the water so a different perspective but you'll never see this you know hanging on the wall of a classroom you see this but then again i'm teaching in an american classroom and we read left to right might there be a bias here now if you're from oceana i think you have a pretty fair argument that there is a considerable bias here and i want to give you a fraction this is geographically geographically the portion of the world that Oceania constitutes one third of the world and if you look at it it might even be more but one third of the world so here's one third of the world that most adults that I've spoken to know little or anything about so let's talk about Oceania now Oceania is the term we use to encompass the whole kit and caboodle it's the whole shebang so here's Australia here's kind of our anchor point and all of these islands to the east and to the north of it, you put it all together, Oceana. It's in the ocean. But Oceana is divided into three groupings, and I want to be real clear on this. These groupings were not decided upon by the indigenous people. These groupings were decided upon by the Europeans. Case in point, the first group, Melanesia. And this is an inherently racist term given by Europeans. Now, Melanesia is uh, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, uh, Fiji, New Caledonia. And the um, part of our skin that gives us coloration is melanin, right? You have more melanin, you'll be darker in color. If you have less melanin, melanesia. So the Europeans saw these people and said, hey, you're fairly dark. I'm going to consider you people melanesia. Uh, you know. This wouldn't be a term people from Melanesia would would use. So this was its first grouping, okay? And you can see it's to the north and the east of Australia if we use that as our anchor point. Now the second group is Polynesia. Now poly, polynomial, uh, polytheism. Poly is many. So Polynesia is just a lot. There's a lot of stuff. So we put it together and we have French Polynesia, the Cook Islands, Tonga, and um, these people here are from French Polynesia. And a little bit of a different look, a little bit of a different culture. We see the grass, I think, which is a stereotypical image a lot of people have. So I want to make a big point. These people are not uh, one flavor. There's a lot of variety, a lot of diversity within all of these groups. So Melanesia being the first designation, a racist designation, but a designation. Polynesia, there's a lot of them. Polynesia, and then we bring them to Micronesia. Now Micronesia, because micro means small. And you can see some groups of people that had a lot of value in our story during World War II in U.S. history. Um, now Guam is still a very important part to America today for a naval base and the Marshall Islands if you recall the island hopping in the Pacific theater of World War II um, and whatnot case in point here is a World War II tank that sank on the way to the island hopping and fighting Japan so Americans I think know more about Micronesia but it's in the construct of World War II it's in the construct of fighting so these are the three basic designations of oceanic people but I want to focus on the contributions and the and the brilliance I would argue of the oceanic people now this is a stick chart okay a, a rebella and I'm probably mispronouncing that terribly but this stick chart is a bunch of bamboo sticks and shells which has the locations of islands in an island change and 
the oceanic people, in this case the Marshallese, used it to navigate themselves between islands that were separated by miles and mile, miles of open ocean. And if you got off course, you die, you dehydrate, you starve to death. But they were able to navigate using remarkable maps, um, the stick chart, you know, being first and foremost. Also, by 600 AD, they had visited the Americas. And I taught you about the Vikings and said, well, the Vikings made it to uh, Canada in, um, in the 900s. Oceana, oceanic people were already in the Americas by 600 AD. They were the first people to engage in blue water voyaging. That is big, vast, ocean going. And this is not an easy thing. From U.S. history, you recall the Titanic was going through big, vast blue water, an enormous technologically advanced ship, and that sank. Um, the oceanic people were able, able to engage in this with success. Now, they produced agricultural and aquacultural techniques still used today. Now, agriculture is a word you know. Aquaculture, um, I think we know it from where we live. Right at 7 in Middle Belt, we have that big hydroponics building where people can grow tomatoes. Now, that's, that's what they use hydroponics for, um, to grow items with uh, water. And these hydroponic techniques... Uh, the precursors of them came from oceanic people. They also created monuments on a huge scale. Now, this is Easter Island, which is considered modern-day Chile, and you can see these monuments they created. This is the boat that the oceanic people were able to engage in deep blue water voyaging. And this looks like a potato. It's called taro, which I think is delicious. And this was the staple crop of the oceanic people. Uh, very similar to a potato, but to grow this in the geographic areas they were living was some tremendous agricultural achievement. Now, going back to what I said at the beginning, why you don't hear a lot about oceanic people, this is the composition of the world population. Now, blue represents people in Asia and Africa. Now, India and China have 2.5 billion people collectively. Absolutely a huge population in Africa, as large of a continent of Africa. And you can see Europe is 10% of the world population. North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean is 14%. Oceanic people con constitute 1% of the world population. And in Detroit, you meet very few people of uh, oceanic origin. So that's why I don't think we hear them uh, discussed very often. And let's go back to the past. So the four world zones, the Americas, Afro-Eurasia, Australasia, and the Pacific, but if you go back here, or go here, I should say, Afro-Eurasia, you know, the Trans-Saharan trade route, the Silk Road, all the advantages. To this day, there's 75% of the world's population there along that ancient uh, world zone. And the least traversed still have the smallest population. So even though these world zones seem like a very long time ago, they have a, a very definite connection to here and now. Now, if you are interested in the culture of Polynesia, uh, or excuse me, oceanic people, uh, I would suggest these four uh, sites. Now, uh, this is the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Every year, this is modern times, they will take an original oceanic vessel and they will sail it throughout the Pacific with great success. And the technology and the teamwork, it's fantastic. Now, there's a musician, and I cannot pronounce his last name. I am not going to butcher that. He goes by Is, if you can imagine. Israel Ka'ano E. Okay, I'm going to hack it up. Uh, fantastic Hawaiian artist, if you've never heard oceanic music, uh, Polynesian music. Uh, check him out. There's a show called 30 uh, on 30 on ESPN called Eddie Would Go. Uh, fantastic documentary about a Hawaiian um, uh, named Eddie Akau that really is fantastic. And then if you're into the rugby, I gave you a little taste of rugby. The greatest rugby player ever is a man named Jonah Lama who's passed away sadly. But he is to rugby what Michael Jordan is to basketball. So check him out if you'd like to know that. So thank you for